Presidential candidate Jeb Bush unveiled his energy plan, which calls for lifting restrictions on producing and exporting oil and natural gas, approving the Keystone XL pipeline, and requiring the federal government to defer to states and tribal governments on energy production rules. He made his remarks at a natural gas company in western Pennsylvania. It's great to have Jeb in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. Eight years ago, Rice Energy was started by three brothers in an apartment in Pittsburgh. And with hard work and a talented team, Rice Energy has become a top 25 producer of natural gas in the United States today. While most people would assume Rice Energy's success is because of the Rice Brothers, the truth is our role as leaders of this company isn't to tell our 370 hardworking employees how to do their job. Our job as leaders is to give our employees the tools and resources they need to do the best job they can and realize their full potential. This requires trust, and this is the trust that we have the right people to do their best and to do what's right. Rice Energy is succeeding because of its people. And we need a leader in Washington that sees our nation's opportunities, recognizes our people's potential, and shepherds our nation and our nation's return to greatness. This presidency isn't about choosing the smartest, the richest, or the most charismatic candidate. For me, this presidency is about choosing the candidate who believes in the people. <laughs> You're all three of those. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this presidency is about choosing the candidate who believes in the people of this nation. That we, the people, have the potential and the work ethic to make our country great. Since launching his candidacy, Jeb has laid out a vision to reform Washington, D.C., to grow our economy so everyone has the opportunity to realize their potential and achieve their dreams, and to restore America's leadership in the world. Jeb's eight years as governor of Florida were marked by record tax cuts, reductions in government spending, strong job growth and more government reform, including an overhaul of Florida's failing educational system. Jeb believed in the people of Florida. He gave them the tools and the resources they needed to succeed, and as a result, Florida succeeded. It prospered. And I'm confident the same can be done with our country. As at Jeb's presidential campaign announcement earlier this year, he closed his speech saying, I will run with heart and I will run to win. Rice Energy and all the hardworking energy workers here in Appalachia are very excited to hear about Jeb's plans for our future including the all-important topic of American energy. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jeb Bush. Thank you, man. Thank you. That was very kind. Thank you all. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, Toby, and Derek, and uh, Ryan now, who's joined the team. Where's Ryan? He's the good-looking one, the younger guy right there. <laughs> it is, uh, this is a great American success story, and, and I'm honored that uh, they're hosting us here as we unveil our energy initiative, our energy policy. It is uh, a great American tradition for families to stay together to build businesses. In fact, it's quite common in the, in the oil sector that this takes place, and, and this is an extraordinary Extraordinary company, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. I want to I wanna mention Toby just for a little bit um, because he's the second brother, and I always admired the second brothers in families. I don't know about you. I think the guy's going places. This is a, a great business that has taken an idea and invested in the idea, took risks, a great American concept, and applied technology in a way that uh, has built a public business now that has created jobs, not just at this business, more than 300 jobs, but all sorts of other suppliers now count on Rice Energy as, as their source for their livelihood. The energy sector in our, in our, in our country is perhaps the most value-added of any that exists 
perhaps even more than information technology. When, when people look at uh, the economy, everybody marvels, right, of the entrepreneurs of Silicon Valley, and there's, there's much to appreciate there. People are reinventing the wheel and creating prosperity and creating opportunities for people out on, out on the West Coast. But the oil and gas sector has been the driver for economic growth, even when you have a president and an administration that has tried to push it down. I just recently saw a study that 40% of all the economic activity since 2008 has happened because of the energy sector in this country, 40%. And if you look at how the wages go and the jobs created, it's a quite similar number. Energy, the energy business in this, in this country creates two times the median wage in the communities in which they serve. And you see the benefits of it. You also see the benefits of the free enterprise system at work. If you think about the, the concept of hydraulic fracking and horizontal drilling, it's been around for a long time, right? These are two existing technologies. It took a private business in the Barnett Shale play in Fort, Fort Worth, a Greek immigrant, by the way, in a private business through trial and error that made it possible for people to realize the potential of this. And then the next generation of entrepreneurs now have exploited this concept to create the possibility of us being energy secure with North American resources within five years. It is an aspiration that is real, and I just appreciate the entrepreneurship that makes it a reality. It's not just celebrating American entrepreneurship that why that's important. Because energy security with North American resources also means that we'll have the lowest cost source of energy to outcompete anybody. I'm sick and tired of people thinking that the Chinese are eating our lunch. What we need to do is to tear down the barrier so that we can outcompete the Chinese and anybody else, and I know America can do it. I've laid out a plan to lift our spirits up a little bit. The new normal in America today is 2% growth. 2% growth means that 6 million more people are living in poverty than the day that Barack Obama got elected president. 2% growth means that disposable income in this country is down close to $2,000 than the day that Barack Obama got elected president. 2% growth, the new normal that the left says you just have to get used, with, used to, means that 6.5 million people are working part-time. 2% growth means that workforce participation rates are lower today than they were in 1977. Why not aspire to a 4% growth? 4% growth means that more money is going to be in people's pockets, that people will be lifted out of poverty, that people will get a job and be able to take a risk and maybe start their own business, or be able to, be able to grow their income because we're investing in the future of this country. 4% growth means that we're, we're strong and we're optimistic and we're hopeful and we're aspirational again. 4% growth means we lead the world, which is exactly what the United States should do. So how do you create 4% growth and rising income that goes along with it? Well, we need to reform the tax code, and I've unveiled a strategy to do that. A corporate tax rate, boys, of 20%, not 35%. A fully expensing the capital investment that you all make so that, so that you invest more and more, just as we need to do in this, in this country. We should lead the world in creating a 21st, manu 21st century manufacturing sector with great workers, with great innovation, and low energy costs and energy sources as far as I can see, we could recreate industrial might, and if we did, we would be stronger and our communities would be, be renewing itself. We need to fix the regulatory system in this country. The mind-numbing rules each and every day from Washington, D.C., thousands and thousands of new rules. The cost of regulation is $1.9 trillion on our economy. That's equal to $15,000 per American family. That means we're not creating the kind of jobs that we have, whether it's Obamacare that creates higher health care costs or the EPA deciding they're going to get involved in things they never imagined before. In fact, just for you in Pennsylvania, I read something yesterday or day before yesterday that 98% of the entire land mass of Pennsylvania will now have to comply with the waters of the United States rule that EPA has, where the, where the uh, EPA now is going to have to give permits out for just about everything whether it's building a shopping center and having a retaining pond. Navigable waters now is the broadest definition possible. It is stoking, it is repressing the ability for us to grow. In the energy sector, it's perhaps the greatest threat. Whether it's methane gas, 
regulation from Washington instead of using common sense regulations that have worked at the state level or the federal lands that exist and, and waters where regulation makes it harder to lease on federal lands to be able to grow the economy. Regulations need to be fixed and that gets us close to the 4% growth scenario, but we need to embrace the energy revolution as well. We have it in our midst and if we did those three things, So here's what I believe. I think we need to lift the ban on crude oil exports. It was, it, was decided, it was designed in 1973 during a time when we had an oil embargo. It might have made sense then. I'm not sure it did. It makes no sense now. We've had 4 million barrels per day of additional production. We should sell that to the world for national security purposes, for lower prices for us, and for greater high wage jobs in this country. Lift that ban, it makes no sense. Lift the ban as it relates to LNG exports. If it's not a free trading country, it, is, it takes almost an act of God to get a permit. There's gas right underneath where we are, ready to be exported. It could be used as a national security de tool to, to deal with Putin. It also creates high wage jobs in this country and lowers energy costs if we're continuing to invest in our, in our future. And so the first step is to let lessen the barrier so that we can produce more. Secondly, we need to create the infrastructure to get this gas to market. Whether it's in New England where you have subsidized fuel oil, heavy, heavy carbon intensive fuel oil at a higher price, that if you allowed the pipe, the infrastructure to get to, get to market, you'd be able to have hundreds of thousands of uh, cubic feet of gas be provided to people that wouldn't need be subsidized at a lower price less carbon intensive, by the way, and creating jobs right here, or the infrastructure that's necessary to get to the industrial heartline or to the refining capacity in the Gulf Coast. Let's unleash the American experience on, on permitting so that we can expedite permitting to be able to create far greater demand. We do not have a supply problem in our energy sector, do we? We've got a demand problem because of the lack of infrastructure. As president, I would expedite permitting to make that happen. And as president, I would approve the XL pipeline, for crying out loud. That is the lowest hanging fruit I've ever imagined. Let me get this straight. The XL pipeline's bad because I'm kind of thinking why. Well, it, it creates jobs in America. It connects us to North America to create a North American energy strategy. That doesn't seem like a bad idea. It's safer to come by pipeline rather than by train, right? It creates lower energy prices and allows the United States to be the, the pricer of, of crude oil rather than have that, those exports go uh, either east or west rather than coming south. It creates jobs here and it creates income here. It seems like it's a pretty good idea. But the radical environmentalists in this country are not allowing Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama to do what they know is the right thing to do. Well, I won't be pressured. I will support the XL pipeline and it'll make sense for our country and it'll create jobs here. <laughs> leases, leases on federal lands and federal waters has declined by about 40%. Even though there's great potential, we know it to be true. And these revenues go to lower the budget deficit, which is still a problem in Washington, D.C. I will make sure that the Bureau of Land Management and the other agencies that are stopping progress on leasing lands will know that the next president wants them to do it in the right way. You can always find the proper balance between the environmental good, the environmental necessities, and economic progress. And that should be the objective of the next administration, to allow us to invest in our own dreams and also protect the natural environment. I did it as governor of the state of, the, of Florida. We can balance economic interests and environmental progress. But don't stifle it because you're upset that American entrepreneurialism, American exceptionalism has created a booming energy sector that you don't like because you want to be able to pick the winners and losers out from Washington, D.C. and impose it, impose your will on the rest of the country. That's not how America works. America works far better from the bottom up rather than the top down. Let's unleash this entrepreneurial spirit and use the federal lands. And I will promise you that I will do that as well. The final, the final suggestion I have is that there should be greater deference to the states. 
In this world where everything is, all the smart people apparently in, in the age of Obama reside in Washington, D.C., the rest of us are just kind of in awe of their raw intelligence and their great capability to tell us how we're supposed to live our lives. We need to turn that upside down. And the states should have greater deference. If Virginia wants to allow federal, off federal waters off their coast to be able to develop that because they believe that will help them grow their economy, then there should be some deference and recognition that Virginians know what's going on. They don't want to destroy their beaches and their natural environment. There's a way to find common ground. If Alaska wants to do the same thing, then there should be some deference rather than imposing the will from Washington, D.C. When I'm elected president, the political hacks and the academics are going to take the back seat. The people that are going to be making these decisions actually might have practical experience in the real world. I apologize, but I think that is the best thing to do. So here, here's my aspiration. I believe we can create a million 21st century manufacturing jobs with the lowest, most abundant source of energy in the world. I believe we can continue to give the middle class of this country the greatest, break that, break, the greatest break they've had in the last six years, which are lower gasoline prices and lower power generation utility prices, because that's the only good deal that they've had in the last six and a half years. And we can continue to do that in a way that liberates the oil and gas producers to be able to provide a continued source of abundant, low-cost energy. I believe, I believe we can outcompete any country in the world, including China. I reject the notion that we're in decline as a nation. But we have to fix these big complex things, and if we do, our economy will grow at 4%. And we'll do it in a way that will create security for the country. The one beautiful thing about a proper energy strategy is it also is a defense of the homeland. There are great threats in this, country, in this world right now, whether it's Russia trying to dominate Europe by using its energy to blackmail the Baltics or the Eastern European or even Western European countries, or the sea lanes being challenged uh, in, 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 South, in the South China Seas. The United States needs to be strong. And the strong America means we have to grow our economy at a far faster rate and be energy and food secure. If we, are, we have food security and energy security, no one will be able to outcompete the greatest country on the face of the earth. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Okay. Jeb, uh, me, Back Toby, and there. Derek, and Ryan, we, uh, we, we sat down last night and, and they, they said, you can ask them a couple questions. So me, Toby, Derek, and Ryan each have our own question. But I'm, right. gonna, I'm gonna ask him on behalf of all four of us. I think Rossenberger's gonna come back pretty quick. <laughs> Is that the question? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, so the first question. Several years ago, we were a small business, starting in Pittsburgh. So as we look at small businesses today, how do your policies help grow small businesses in America? So, small businesses actually in America, for the first time in recorded history, they may have, may have happened in the 17th century or 16th century, back up where you guys came from, up in New England, you know, there may have been a time where there were businesses closed, more businesses closing than opening, but that's what it is in America today. It's tragic. I mean, this, this country has led the world because we're dynamic and we're, you know, the world doesn't work like in a planned way in America. We don't do plan it all out real well. We, we respond to opportunity. And that's how we succeed. We're a 10 steps forward, five steps back, three steps forward, five steps back, 10 steps forward country. We're not a boom, boom, you know, we're not just march and be told what to do and fill out the right form and get in line and do all this stuff. We're, we're, we're totally horrible at that. And the small business sector is the one that's been hurt by all of these rules on top of every aspect of human endeavor. It starts in Washington, but frankly, some states have also imposed major rules on top of everything. I mean, to start a business in California, you gotta pay 800 bucks to start with, and then you gotta do it again and again every year. Well, if, you're, if you got a business with 10,000 bucks and you're pursuing your dream, yours probably was a little bit more when you started, but a lot of businesses start with borrowing money from, you know, crazy Uncle Harry, and he gives you 10 grand and you're out just killing it, trying to do your best, and if you have to pay $800 for an occupational license fee or tax, and then you gotta pay another tax, and you gotta pay the excuse me for living tax, and then you gotta go to Washington and you have higher healthcare costs because of 
Obamacare and the, and the system we have, you add it all up and small businesses don't have the lobbyists, do they? They don't have the accountants. They don't have the compliance officers. You guys are just starting to learn about this as a public company. And it makes it harder. Scale is not the definition of a successful business, and it shouldn't be. But in fact, in America, it is becoming more and more that way. The incumbents don't mind when Dodd-Frank imposes all sorts of rules on every borrower. They don't care because the big banks can basically share those costs over a gigantic asset base. But there has, there's only been two banks formed in the last uh, six years in America. Two new banks. There's a reason for that. And so compl decomplicating life, shifting regulation away from Washington to the state level, recognizing that there should be an economic benefit for every rule that is imposed. I believe we ought to have a regulatory budget in Washington. So if you create a real budget, this is what the UK has done. Every dollar of additional costs, in my mind, there ought to be a dollar of, a, of some place where there are savings in the regulation. You should have no increase in regulation. And we ought to have a sunset review of all rules to have a house spring house cleaning, to be able to shed some of the rules that might have made sense 30 or 40 years ago. So being, and then putting men and women in positions of responsibility that actually understand the, the business, the industry that they're regulating, and don't have a political agenda, that actually want to have a balanced view between protecting the water or the air or the workforce environment and the economic impacts that businesses bring. Bringing common sense to, uh, to Washington in this regard would be helpful. Look, I'm 62 years old. I know I look a lot younger than that, right? told me I was charismatic and good looking or something. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the deal. I was, I was governor for eight years where we did all this stuff. And we led the nation in small business growth for, for eight years. We created 1.3 uh, million net new jobs during those eight years, even though the government shrunk by 13,000. We cut taxes by 19 billion. We created a, a field of dreams and people pursued their dreams in Florida more than other places because of it. But I've been in the private sector for 33 years and in government for nine. And the practical private sector experience is what I want to bring to Washington, D.C., of starting a business with three people and growing it to the full, largest full-service commercial real estate company in South Florida to 280 people before they kicked me out the door. That experience is the one that I think is more relevant in many ways about what's wrong with Washington. They only hang out with the big dogs. They hang out with the big companies. They hang out and interact with their lobbyists and with their, with their lawyers and their accountants. And the small businesses don't have access to that, and they're being hurt by all of this. That's all I got. Good answer. <laughs> okay. This, this question's from Derek. Derek's the ever the, the, the pessimist in the Rice family. So Derek gets how exporting more American energy is good for companies like Rice Energy, but how does it affect America's role in the world? Well, it, it actually is good for consumers. It may sound counterintuitive. You export crude. Uh, you're, some people say we should hoard it. And the net result of that is refiners actually get higher margins and gas prices, gasoline prices are higher. Exporting crude actually lowers uh, costs at home. It may seem counterintuitive, but if you if you talk to the experts, they'll tell you unanimously that that's the case. So it's good for consumers. It's good for people working because every time you create a new market for your product, whether it's gas or, uh, or, or liquids or oil, you're creating an opportunity to grow your business, right? And invest in your own business. And that creates economic opportunity for the employees of, of Rice Energy and for all of the suppliers of Rice Energy. This community and for the landowners that are leasing you the properties and they're buying pickup trucks thanks to those royalty checks, aren't they? They're being able to provide for their, their child's education. They're saving their money so that their kid could go to the, the university of their choice. They're doing all sorts of things that they want to do rather than being told what they should do. So this, this, there's a vitality to this that helps not just the business uh, but, but the entire community in which they're serving. And, and frankly, it also is a national security issue. So it's going to get cold here pretty soon. Not here, but in Estonia, and in Poland, and in Germany, and in Romania. And if you look at the, look at the, the heating necessities of Europe, it gets really cold there. Where do they get their gas? 
By and large, they get it from the Russians. And they're basically held hostage, and they can be blackmailed. Gazprom can raise their prices whenever they want, and they've done it. Ask the Ukraine people what it's like to live through a, a winter with, uh, with uh, Russia being your sole source of supply. Why not use it as a national security tool to be able to export LNG to be an alternative to Russian natural gas? It's cheaper, it's cleaner, if you're interested in the environment. Our natural gas is significantly less carbon intensive than the Russian natural gas. We're much more committed to protecting the environment. So we're exporting a cleaner energy source, but more importantly, it's in our national security interest to show resolve against Russia to show support for the NATO allies, because when we, when we need them, they're not gonna be there if we're not, we're not there on their side. We should have a north-south corridor from Poland down to East, Eastern Europe using American natural gas as a source of our foreign policy tools. And the same applies as it relates to Asia. There's no reason why this can't be an effective tool for us to re-engage with the world. This is a wonderful intersection of high wage, high growth, high job growth uh, economies where we benefit because we're energy secure, where we lower our energy prices and we use it as a tool for our national security around the world. I can't think of a better deal than what we're going through right now. We're just not exploiting it to the fullest extent possible. Look at this guy right here. That's a, that's a heck of a picture right there. Okay, the You're third question. You're taking a picture of them taking pictures of me? <laughs> okay, the, the third question is coming from the, the more sensitive brother, the, the youngest one, Ryan. Ryan, he's Ryan. an Aggie. How can he be sensitive? Yeah, yeah. So, so Ryan's question is, how would your reform plan... <laughs> hey, Ryan. <laughs> Hug it out. <laughs> my, bro, my dad's an Aggie. Also, I'm an Aggie. <laughs> okay. He's an Aggie. I went to the University of Texas, but in, frankly, in our family now, because my dad's library is at Texas A&M University and they love him there, I'm an Aggie too. That's why I gave him a warm embrace. So, so Ryan's question is, is, how would your reform plan for federal government regulations affect energy workers and their families here in Pennsylvania? Every dollar of reduction of a rule that creates economic benefit and achieves the social good. I'm not suggesting unregulating the world. What I'm suggesting is common sense 21st century rules rather than the complex 20th century rules allow progress to go forward, which means more money in your pocket, plain and simple, that's it. Every dollar that we extract from cost of making, you know, creating possibilities for, for workers and businesses creates money in people's pockets. And we haven't had that. We've had six million more people in poverty, and we have declining income for the great middle of this country. Disposable median income is down $2,000 since the day that Barack Obama got elected president. And it's because of the massive uncertainty and the confusing rules and the costs of the rules that businesses have to share with their workers. That's, that's it, it's plain and simple. Same with healthcare. Every time you create a well-intended idea of Obamacare is well-intended, I'm sure, but the simple fact is it imposes costs on businesses that then force businesses to make employees have to share more in the health care costs, and you see it happening with higher deductibles, higher co-pays, more costs to employees. That means your take-home pay ultimately is going down. So the best kind of rules are the ones that protect whatever it is you're trying to protect, but at the lowest possible cost so that people have money in their pockets. Let me give you an example, because I know there's, there's this is, um, this, your success is, is, uh, makes environmentalists miserable. Not the common sense environmentalists, but the radical ones. They don't like it. And it's just, it makes no sense to me because a growing economy allows us to spend money on protecting wild America. When our economy in Florida grew by 4.4% per year, we generated revenue that allow us to have the largest land purchasing programs in the country to, to protect pristine Florida. We began the process of serious, seriously trying to uh, restore the Everglades, an incredible treasure for our country. We focused on cleaning up water bodies, not just the Everglades, but others. If we were growing at the tepid rate of the economy today, we wouldn't have the resources to be able to protect the natural environment. And so there has to be a win-win. 
And that's, that's what we need to get to is common sense regulation and not this kind of, you know, finger licking, you know, making, making people feel like they're doing something bad when in fact you've created 300 plus jobs above the median income of a community. All of the suppliers that uh, are dependent upon your business now love you too. You're creating wealth and prosperity for yourselves, but for hundreds, if not thousands, of other people as well. That's the American way. We should be celebrating. Where's the marching band, for crying out loud? This is what we should be doing. They all have stock. The employees? Yeah. Every single one. Yeah. And, and I hope your stock price goes up, too. Thank you. Because <laughs> that's American capitalism right at its best. It's not owned by one or two people. It's shared by everybody. The, everybody's interest is aligned the right way. You know, praise Jesus. This is, this is I, I just, I get fired up when I see examples like this because this, this is what separates us from the rest of the world. One other point about how we should be proud of this country. There are places where shale exists in other parts of the world, right? I mean, it's all over. Argentina has a massive potential shale play. The Russians have it. Uh, the Poles and the Germans and the, and the UK, the Brits have shale plays. Where else other than the United States has it worked? Nowhere. It's, it's only in America, and why is that? A, we risk more, we take risks. We just have a culture of, of risk taking, not crazy risks, but, but risks that really allows you to, to move forward. B, we have private property rights embedded, embedded in who we are, it's in our DNA. The, you know, I was, we were watching the, the men and women that do the leasing for the business. That's, that's a robust market that only exists in America. Only in America do private landowners own the subsurface rights to the extent they do in this country, and that creates a dynamic uh, energy sector because as prices go down, leases go, prices go down, and you create opportunities that you, you guys take advantage of. It's uniquely American. It's uniquely America to, try, to, to have trial and error to try something and then it doesn't work, but adjust and make it more dynamic. The costs of your production have dropped by what in the last three or four years? 50%. 50%. I mean, where else in the world do you get this kind of dynamic response? We should stop trying to default to getting in line and being told by Washington, D.C. what to do and embrace who we are. This, this is what makes America so extraordinary and so special. And this is why I'm totally convinced we can grow at 4%. We just have to unleash the, the animal spirits in Americans, and we will be America renewed again. Preach. I feel like I'm at the pulpit. So my last like question. Like a tent revival meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so the last question is on that last point you made about the 4% the growth. So right now the economy is growing at 2%. You say it can grow at 4%. Why do you think that can be done? Because it has in the past. So past can be prologue, but you've got to have the right policies. If you impose all these rules on top of every aspect of business, you're not going to grow at 2%. If you have the most convoluted tax code in the world, you're not going to grow at 2%. I'll give you an example. We have uh, a, a new phenomena called inversions. And this is, this is a reality because of our tax code. A small foreign business buys a large, uh, large U.S. business to consolidate their, their activities in that other country because their corporate tax rates are lower. We have the highest tax rates in the industrialized world. And the net effect of this is we lose job and the government lose, loses revenue and people lose income. And all the communities in which these op businesses operate have a diminished uh, partner, if you will, for the florists and all the other people that depend on these large businesses in the communities, they lose their, they lose part of their economic vitality. Well, in my tax proposal, I've said, and it's because we have worldwide income as kind of our driver. Where's the CFO? Nod your head if, uh, nod your head if I'm correct. Okay. So we have worldwide, our companies are taxed on worldwide income. There's $2 trillion of cash overseas that doesn't come back because it will be taxed at an onerous rate. What I've proposed is an 8.75% rate for that money to come back. $2 trillion could come back. And to, to move back to a territorial source of, uh, of taxation, which every other country has. If you did that, you would have hundreds of billions of dollars invested in 
enterprises all across this country creating higher wage jobs. If you fully, if you fully capitalize all capital investment in the first year, you're going to have an explosion of productivity. And we're rebalancing from, the, from Wall Street to Main Street, in effect. We're, we're creating, leveling out the playing field so that the heartland of our country and the industrial side of our economy will begin to grow and prosper. Everybody else does better when that happens. So fixing our tax code, fixing the regulatory system, embracing the energy revolution in our midst, as you all have heard today, fixing a broken immigration system that right now is a drain on our economy that could be a huge catalyst for high sustained economic growth. If we narrow the number, if we enforce the rule of law, protected our borders, made it, made it clear that coming here legally is easier than coming here illegally, and then picked who we wanted to have as new Americans, you would grow the economy at a far faster rate. There's no, no doubt about that. And then dealing with the structural deficit problems that relate to our entitlement challenges, we need to preserve and protect our entitlements for those that have them, but we need to make sure that we reform the whole system so that the next generation can achieve it. You'll grow at 4% as far as the eye can see, and we'll lead the world. We'll be as we are, we'll lead the world. I mean, I'll, I'll close with this, a simple exercise, because I know people are deeply pessimistic about the future of the country, and they listen to politicians on the left and right talk about how bad things are. You know, you, can, you need therapy probably at the end of some of these debates. Here's the deal, if we opened up the entire world and said you got 30 days one-way ticket, you can pick where you want to live. I wonder who would win that. We would win it. We'd win it going away. We'd win it a thousand to one. We win it because this country is still the beacon of freedom. This is the hope for the world. This is the greatest country on the face of the earth. And if we start acting like it, we will be it. It's that simple. And that's what I believe. So thank you all very much. Continued success. We love you very much. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.